great pleasure to be able to share this music and to hear this wonderful performance from these marvelous students, uh, marvelous young professionals. Uh, and I thank them very much indeed for a very kind invitation. Also, what a pleasure to be able to join music in this wonderful, wonderful building. It's quite it's great. Thank you. Let's go back to um, 1810, a great year for piano music. <laughs> I mean, that's a terrific <coughs> understatement. 1810, Schumann is born. Several months before him, Chopin is born. A few months later in 1811, Liszt is born. A few months before 1810, 1809, Mendelssohn is born. Four legendary names in piano music. And um, they all wrote a huge amount of piano music. Why the piano? Well, the piano was the coming instrument. I mean, it, it is still absolutely central to our musical culture. But at that time, it was developing technically very rapidly. Um, it was a relatively new instrument. The harpsichord had died out around about 1800. The piano had been developing not quite as effective as the harpsichord, though with vastly more potential for expression. Because it was not a plucking instrument, it was a percussion instrument where you could vary the volume and the tone by the way you struck the keys. Whereas on the older instruments, you pluck and that was it. You couldn't really do much else except change keyboards. So the piano had vast potential. It wasn't quite like this one. A modern grand is, uh, um, is it probably known for, or oh, it may not be quite known for. Uh, it's made of the frame, it's made of cast iron. The strings are of steel. Many of them are overwound to make them even thicker and more powerful. The resonance that comes from this instrument is absolutely vast. And we've heard from these wonderful players just what you can do with a piano. You can do anything with it, you know. You can play very quietly, you can play with a tremendous singing tone, or you can, you can play in a very percussive, aggressive way. All of this can be done with, with an instrument where you're hitting the strings, actually. It's a percussion instrument. So the great achievement of the piano is that it deceives you into thinking it's really <coughs> a singing instrument because it's really a percussion instrument. It, it sings so beautifully because of the way it's constructed. So um, Schumann's piano wasn't quite the same as this. It would have been <coughs> smaller. It would have had one octave less. And it would have uh, had also the sound would have been much more stringy. And when you hit the notes, it would have uh, rung with a bell-like sound at the beginning and then decayed very rapidly. But nonetheless, the piano was, even then, incredibly expressive. And everybody wanted to play it because you can play anything on the piano. Melody, bass, everything. You can transcribe anything for the piano, as we heard with these wonderful transcriptions from Liszt and Rachmaninoff and so on. It's the instrument where you can really do more or less anything. So the piano was um, a tremendous achievement and everybody wanted to write for it. These four composers <coughs> all wrote wonderful music. But Schumann was different. Schumann's music is different. Why is it different? Well, the most obvious answer is that he gives the most extraordinary titles to his pieces. Um, if you listen to Mendelssohn, many pieces are called Songs About Words. They're songs. The pieces that these composers wrote, the, the title describes the genre. Song, um, Chopin, Waltz, Study, Nocturne, Mazurka. Liszt, in many cases, he would transcribe songs or write pieces inspired by a poem, as we've heard. Um, Schumann, how about <coughs> Almost too earnest. What does that mean? Um, catch me if you can. Um, child falling asleep by the fireside. These were totally personal titles which he gave his pieces, quite different from anybody else. He's creating a world around himself. He's typical way in which he related these little pieces was by putting them into scenes. Scene, that, those titles I gave you came from scenes from childhood. Uh, a set of pieces where an adult looks back at family life and childhood life, life in the family. Very intimate. 
So this is a great characteristic of Schumann, which became very distinctive. Um, also, there's a personal side to his music. Um, it goes even more than just describing domestic life. He likes to capture his friends in musical notation. The very first piece he wrote offers one variations on the theme of Arbeg. Who was Arbeg? Arbeg was his a, a lady he knew, a young lady he knew, Meta Arbeg. So he turns her name into musical notation. A, B flat, um, E, G, E, la, 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 la. That becomes the beginning of his piece. E, la, 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 la. Off you go. He's got composition. Just those notes taken from a family name. Uh, well, I shouldn't do endlessly this kind of thing in music. Uh, you know, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> Until you hit some problems, uh, like what is H um, in music. Uh, so there were a few adjustments to be made. But Schumann liked to do this, and he loved also to think of scenes. He told his mother to the, at the end of his piece offers two papillon butterflies. He says, go and read uh, the end of a, of a particular poem by one of his favorite German poets. It's, it's a ball. It's the story of a masked ball. You'll understand the music more. He was very interested in grouping pieces with the idea of a ball or a dance. Dance runs right through all of Schumann's early music. Most of it's a dance time in three time. So you've got this background of personal images, but also privacy, intimacy. Okay, so then we get Carnival, Opus 9. Carnival really brings all this to a tremendous climax because you've got 21 pieces. And he's given them a strange title. He says, C'est mignon, meaning small pieces, on four notes. He's telling you that they're on four notes. And if you look at the musical score, halfway through, he's written into the music, and it's printed in the printed music, three little groups of four notes. And they're the same notes in slightly different order, basically. And he's called them sphinxes. In other words, work this out if you can, reader or player. What does this really mean? Uh, well, we now know from his letters and, and from reminiscences and various things, exactly what they did mean, where it all came from. Well, very interesting. He's decided to base his piece on four notes, A, S, C, <coughs> E. And from this, where did this come from? This came from the birth town of his then girlfriend, Ernestine Ash. And he turned that into musical notation. A S in German is A flat. Um, a flat, C, B in German is uh, B flat. And so you've got uh, H rather in, in German is B natural. So a flat, C, B natural. And then he suddenly realized that his own name fitted in some crazy way with this, S, C, H, S in German notation is E flat, E flat, C, B natural, A. He also worked out that this, these, no, these letters came into the word fashion, which is the German for carnival. We just heard one of the reference to the carnival fashion shrink that's me, the carnival jest from Vienna, which he wrote several years later. So here we go, he loved this kind of thing. Notes can make, names can be turned into musical notes, places can be turned into musical notes. And so this provided him with his little group of like, e -da 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 -da. Da -da 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 that's what I'm You'll hear all these pieces playing around with this little group of notes. Some of the pieces don't fit that. Um, they're kind of interlude pieces, connection pieces. But most of them do. So that's this kind of raw material, these intervals, but the way in which he 
system is simply stupendous. The different rhythms, the different patterns he creates just from these notes. Okay, so let's say that fashion gave him a clue to the idea that he might want to make his scene a carnival. Everybody shows up to a carnival, and we all have fun, and maybe there's some masks which create a little bit of secrecy, a little bit of mystery. Who's behind the mask? Uh, so he's got the idea of the fashion or the carnival which comes before Lent in the Christian year. And he was probably thinking of Vienna, but we can't be sure of that. So we go through this series of pieces. He brings in various characters. First of all, he brings characters in from the traditional carnival, Piero, Columbine, Harlequin, Pantaloon. Then he brings in his family, or not his family, his friends, himself, of course, he is at the middle of it. <coughs> then this lady, Ernestine, and another lady, Clara, Chiarina is Clara. Clara is the coming girlfriend. She's going to become Clara Schumann. She's Clara Pink. She's a fabulous pianist. He's just met her because he's just started taking piano lessons with her father, Friedrich Wink. And so he falls for Clara. So he's kind of betwixt and between at this particular point, 1835 to 1836. He's 25. She's 60, but she's already an incredibly famous pianist and is going to become one of the great pianists of all time. So also some other people in the circle, Chopin, Friedrich Chopin. Um, Schumann greatly admired Chopin, but Chopin didn't greatly admire Schumann. He thought his German music was rather strange and probably rather pretentious and rather heavy, you know, a bit self-conscious. Uh, but Chopin greatly admired Clara. He thought she was one of the greatest pianists, so that was the real link there. Paganini, fabulous pianist, a fabulous violinist, had become incredibly famous. Um, Schumann greatly admired him, so he decided he put him in there as well. And then finally, there were one or two other titles which are just are filler titles. Um, we can't be absolutely sure what they mean. And then there's a tremendous finale, the um, march of the Band of David against the Philistines. Who is the Band of David? The Band of David was all the people that Schumann liked to feel were his friends fighting against terrible, vulgar, modern music. The, the flip side of the wonderful technology of the piano was that many composers were writing extremely superficial music, display music, empty music, music that just showed off what they could do, not music with a real substance. Real substance for Schumann was Beethoven, Bach, Schubert, all the composers we now regard as the greatest in that tradition. He was fighting for their reputation against a lot of popular music which was very superficial. So he was David, the hero of great art. The Philistines were led by Goliath and we all know what happened to Goliath. True art will always win out and so there's this extraordinary last piece which demonstrates his ideal. Schumann behind all this extraordinarily you know, colourful imagination in, in the carnival was a very very serious artist and he ran his own newspaper providing criticisms of new music and then he lived, he had a limited life we know but he was incredibly creative and then went on to write major orchestral works, symphonies, concertos, and then choral works. His output is simply stupendous. It's one of the great outputs of all time. And yet, this particular era we're talking about, the 1830s, he's still feeling his way with this kind of music. He's not yet writing really large-scale pieces, or not fully large-scale pieces for orchestra, certainly. But this is extraordinary music. I don't think it's almost impossible to imagine a more imaginative handling of the piano than we hear in Carnival. It's one of the really true greatest works for the piano. So now we're going to hear the whole work. We can hear it in segments, uh, two or three, three or four pieces three from each segment. And I'll just give a very brief
brief introduction to the character of the piece. This is my own little start with the piano, and um, Jan is going to start us pop. Yeah.
turn to Schumann's uh, own personal group in, in himself. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know he had a, uh, his two personalities for himself. One he called Eusebius, was the dreamy side of Schumann, yeah. and the other was Florestan, who was the assertive, aggressive side of Schumann. In both of these cases, the, the motto, the A, E flat, C, E, 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 it's still present in the music. This one, Eusebius, is wonderful, wonderfully difficult to play, really, because he, he's really dreamy. How do you do dreamy in music? The meter is two beats in a bar, and there are seven notes in the tune. So the tune wanders around, and the left hand division of the bar, the second quarter note, really appears at three and a half way through the seven group. It's meant to slightly deceive you with a sense of regularity, take you out. He's a dreamy guy, Eusebius. Florestan, tremendously aggressive and heroic. Coquette. This, is, this doesn't have a specific meaning, but just coquettish, flirt, flirtatious. A wonderfully flirtatious piece, and then it leads straight into the next piece, which is the replique, which is a repetition of the flirtatious piece. Um, slightly different in character, but <coughs> containing much of the same idea. So it starts with a good idea, and then you're straight back into the coquettish movie music. At this point in the printed music, uh, Schumann set the sphinxes for you to unravel them. But they're not normally played. I think they're all the two recordings where Somebody's decided to play them, but that wasn't really the idea. Schumann was simply presenting you with this visually and saying, go on, see if you can work it out. So, now pieces five to eight of Kampa. Papillon. Uh, Opus 2, a whole set of pieces called Papillon, 
but they weren't really descriptions of butterflies. They, he really was describing the way that music had come to him through improvisation. You know, as a, as a young man, apparently, he used to improvise all the time. And he's, he used to play pieces character, characterising his family and friends, and everybody knew exactly who they were. <laughs> he just got that capacity. Because he wanted to be a pianist, but um, fortunately, he damaged his hand. Because if he hadn't damaged his hand, he might just have become a bad luck pianist and not a great composer for the piano. Who knows? Anyway, Papillon, wonderfully vivacious piece, wonderful keyboard piece, again using those same notes A, E flat, C um, as, as the outline. And then the piece is called Ash Shah. There he's actually giving a bit of a clue away. Uh, look inside this music to see what you can find. Now this is a presto piece where he's used a lot of uh, short notes uh, against the, the harmony notes. You, could, you simply couldn't hear the, the motto inside here, but it's there. From, from here onwards, he's focusing on the A flat, C, B. E, da, pattern, much more. Um, okay, next piece, Chiarina. Chiarina is his uh, special name for Clara. So Clara, the, the young lady who used to be so important in his life, this is a piece dedicated to her. It's very passionate, really, when you listen, compared to all the other pieces. There's an intensity of feeling here. And then Chopin. Oh, what's Chopin doing in here? It's a kind of Chopin followed by Estrella. Chopin is a kind of a mediator between these two. Chopin is the real deal. Estrella's on the way out. He's put Chopin in the middle. Chopin hated this piece. Chopin hated Schumann's music, as I mentioned. But um, the, the great thing everybody's noticed is that this piece called Chopin doesn't sound anything like Chopin at all. It just sounds like Schumann. So um, that's great. It's a lovely piece. Gorgeous singing melody, but he called it Chopin. Uh, so now we hear pieces 9 to 13, Papillon, Ashcha, Chiarina, Chopin and Estrella. Thank you. 
priests now other means of religion confession. This is a, presumably some kind of confession of love. I don't know exactly what its context is, but it's a passionate piece. Um, very, I think, highly expressive piece, but it's just called a <coughs> bird. Then, a promenade, a walk, a sort of walk you might take in a nice social occasion. Beautiful piece, marked, easy going, commodo. And then, a piece called Pause, or Pause, but it isn't a pause at all. It's really, a pre it's really an introduction, uh, a big preparation for the final piece, which is a march of the Band of David, the League of David, against the Philistines. This has to round the whole piece off, so it completely matches the first piece, the preamble. Um, it has the same material as well, some of the same material. It starts differently and then starts requoting from the beginning. And another thing that Schumann does is to throw in the so-called grandfather song, which is a traditional song, which comes from, I think, 17th, 17th century German song, but it's, it's, it's often played on many convivial occasions in Germany. And so that rounds off the entire piece. Extraordinary composition, which he tried to unify with fundamental ideas, but which really is just a carnival. We mustn't talk too seriously for kind of connections. We just take it for what it is, one extraordinary musical experience after another. So now we hear the final pieces, 18 to 21. Thank you. 